Hi, this is Bartosz Miluski with the fifth installment of the C++11 concurrency series. You might remember that last time I introduced uh, the function async that is used to create tasks which are very similar to threads. So today I would like to explain what tasks are, what is task-based concurrency, and also give you an example of a massively parallel program. So async essentially can do anything that threads can do and more. For instance, if you want to create a separate thread, then you call async with the launch directive as the first argument, which is equal to launch async. This will create a thread. But you can also call async with a different launch directive, launch deferred, which will not create a thread. It will just combine the function and the arguments into an object that will then be called when you call get or wait on a future that's returned by async. Now the default when you don't specify this argument is an OR of async and deferred, which means that the system is free to pick whatever is more convenient. The arguments to async are more or less the same as for a thread constructor. You pass it a function pointer or a function object, a callable object, or a lambda. Then you can pass a variable number of arguments of arbitrary types. And what's important is these types will be checked against the argument types of the function you're calling. So this is type safe. But of course, on top of this, you can pass a launch directive, which you cannot with threads. But async also can do more. Async has a built-in future and also a built-in promise which is invisible to the user. It just sits there and unlike with threads, you don't have to explicitly pass the promise, you don't have to set value, and you don't have to set exception. You just, like in a regular function, you just call return or throw. Now, if you don't want to use the future that's returned by async, you can just ignore it. However, what is still missing in the C++11 standard is task-based concurrency. And this is, uh, at least for me, it's pretty disappointing. So let me explain a little bit what is meant by task-based concurrency. As I said, this is not implemented in C++11, but it is present in some libraries, in particular Microsoft Parallel Pattern Library implements it, and Intel Threading Building Blocks, and there's also OpenMP, which is just a set of macros, sort of a language extension, plus a library, a runtime library. What problem are tasks or task-based concurrency is trying to solve? The problem is how many threads to use. I mean, how many threads to use depends very much on the resources you have available at runtime. So if you, if you are running on a massively multi-core processor, you probably want to use more threads. But if you're running on a single core or two core machine, you probably don't want to use that many threads because then you have the overhead of creating all these threads. So it would be nice for the programmer just to specify, hey, these tasks can be run in parallel. I know that they can be run in parallel. But I let the system pick how many threads to create, which of them will actually be run in parallel. And this is done using things like thread pools, where you can actually reuse threads. You have a finite number of threads, which depends on how many processors you have at runtime. And the more sophisticated implementations use so-called work-stealing queues, where tasks are actually redistributed 
between processors dynamically. Let me show you how task-based programming might work. Imagine that there's one thread, let's say the main thread, that creates multiple tasks. In this case, we have six tasks created by one thread, which is running on core one of our multiprocessor. So core one will now have to execute six tasks and uh, is highly oversubscribed while core 2, 3, and 4 are sitting there idle. So what's happening is that core 2, 3, and 4, they actually run a special thread, uh, a system thread that is constantly looking at other cores to see what they are doing. And if they see a core, in this case core 1, that, that is oversubscribed, they will try to steal the tasks. They won't steal the task that is currently executing, that's here task 1 in pink, but they will try to steal all the other tasks. So this is the result of the stealing. Okay, core 1 is still left with task 1 and task 2, but core 2, 3, and 4 have stolen some of the tasks from it, and they are now executing four tasks in parallel. So they are using parallelism that was described by the programmer in the program to the fullest advantage. It doesn't make sense to run more than these four tasks at once because there are no more cores, right? So they have partitioned the job in a most efficient way possible. Now once they execute the current tasks, they start executing the rest of the tasks. So in this case, core 1 and 2 will be executing task 2 and 4 in parallel, while core 3 and 4 will be sitting idle. And of course, looking for more job, looking for opportunities to steal some stuff. Here's a general comparison of task-based programming and thread-based programming. At the abstraction level, for instance, threads are considered low-level abstraction because the programmer is responsible for many details of creating threads, of passing special arguments, joining, and so on. Tasks are a little bit higher level because the system takes care of many details. As far as resources go, threads are usually more heavyweight. They are usually implemented as operating system threads. So first of all you have to call the operating system which takes time and the operating system will allocate stuff for you. It will allocate a stack and it will also allocate a lot of kernel data structures and so on. Also tearing down a thread is expensive. In comparison tasks can be implemented in a more lightweight way. They can, for instance, reuse the same thread pool. You can have a finite number of threads and you can just reuse them to run multiple tasks. You can also have user-level threads that don't necessarily use preemption, but they collaborate with each other. They also tend to be solutions for different problems. Threads have more to do with latency. When you have functions that can block, for instance, file input or connecting to a server, you don't want your whole program to sit there idle, blocked, waiting for data. You want other threads to take over and do some useful work or be more responsive to user input or to incoming traffic or whatever. Tasks, on the other hand, are more focused on throughput. You are running on a multi-core machine. You want to take advantage of all these cores. You want to run things in parallel. Now that you know what task-based concurrency 
is supposed to be. Let me show you that this is not what the C++11 implements as async tasks. So I'll write a program in which I will create 10 tasks using async and each task will print its thread ID. So this way we will know how many threads are created and how the tasks are executed. So let me start by printing the main thread's ID. Now thread ID is in this namespace this thread and the function is called get ID. Now get ID returns an opaque type but we can always print it. So the first printout will be the main thread ID. Now when we create async tasks they will return futures so we have a vector to store these futures. This will be futures of the type void. They won't return any value. They will just purely side effect futures. So we'll have a loop int i equals 0 i less than 10 plus plus i and in this loop will create async tasks and they return futures so auto future equals std async and notice that I'm using the default launch policy so I'm actually not specifying any launch policy and that's equivalent to the default one uh, we'll pass it a lambda and this is a lambda that takes no argument so I can skip the parentheses there and the first thing we would like to do is to ma make the task sleep so that we know which task is actually executing in parallel and which tasks are executed serially so the sleep function again is in the this thread namespace and it's called sleep4 and if we want to specify duration, we use the chrono namespace. Chrono seconds, let's say two seconds. Okay, now we want to print stdc out the thread ID. std this thread get ID and follow it, let's say, by a space. Okay, close the body of the lambda, close the parentheses, and put a semicolon. Now that we have a future, we have to push it on the stack, or actually on a vector. Futures push back our future. Okay, except that it won't work because future has no copy constructor. Therefore we have to move it. STD move. Okay. And that works. Close the for loop. Now we have to wait for all these tasks to finish. So we'll put a loop here. A for each loop. For each loop, yes, and pass it uh, the iterators futures begin and futures end and the last parameter is the function that is to be executed on each of the futures and we'll just implement it as a lambda and this lambda will take a future as a parameter. So std future, and we have to specify the type void, a future returning void, okay, and the body. And in the body we simply do future wait. 
So this will wait for the future to finish. We don't call get because there is no value to be returned. These are void futures. Okay. So this is the program. And of course, we have to close the Lambda. And let me compile it. So let's run this program and see what happens. Main thread has ID 1. Then six new threads are created and run in parallel. But after that, the rest of the tasks are executed serially in the main thread. Now, when I saw this behavior the first time, I thought it was a bug in Anthony's implementation of just thread. But it's not. I confirmed it with Hans Bohm, who is the expert in C++11 concurrency. And he said that an implementation that would actually do work stealing and run tasks in threads other than the parent thread would be non-standard compliant. So this is unfortunately what we have to live with until the next standard, maybe in 10 years from now. Now let me show you one more thing, another quirk of the C++11. What happens when we remove the wait for the futures? From my last tutorial, you might have gotten the impression that the destructors of futures will force the tasks to execute. Now, this is only partially true. Let me show you what happens in reality. Okay, now we are at the point of destruction, and let's just step over it and see what happens. Look at this. Main thread ID is 1, thread 6, 2, 5, 4, 3, and 7 actually ran to completion. But that's 6 threads. What happened to the other tasks? Well, the other tasks were scheduled not to execute in separate threads, but in serial. They were deferred. And for deferred tasks, the destructor does not execute the task. So you get this sort of uh, random result. Some of the tasks will be forced to finish, others will not. I think it's a good time now to do something useful, a program that for instance, does a directory tree listing using asynchronous tasks. So the idea is, in main, I will start an async task that calls this function list directory. And this function takes a directory path as input and returns a vector of strings. I type def a vector of strings as a string vector. And this vector will contain the names of all the files in the directory tree. So how will it work? Well, first of all, I create a now empty listing, right? I add the first entry will be just the name of the directory I'm listing. And then I will list the current directory and uh, for all files in this directory, I will just push them back on the listing. But for all the directories, subdirectories, I will spawn new async tasks to do the listing. And this is actually a good use for concurrency to reduce latency. All these functions that are listing directories they actually block waiting for disk input. So it's good to have other threads that can jump in and do some useful work while some of the threads are blocked. So while I'm creating tasks, I will have to store the futures in, in a vector. So this is a vector of futures, and these are futures that uh, contain a string vector, because this is what list directory returns. So let me start by listing a directory. 
for directory iterator. And I should mention here that I have implemented here a very primitive implementation of something that will probably enter the standard pretty soon, and that's functions that deal with file system. So there will be a header file system. Here I have a file system.h, that's my own implementation, which contains things like directory iterator. And I'm using the interface that was proposed for the standard and will probably be implemented pretty soon. So directory iterator it, and it takes the directory as input, right? It has a directory iterator as the end. So when you construct directory iterator with no arguments, it actually is the end of uh, iteration plus plus it. Okay. And now we have to decide whether we have a file or a directory. So this is what we can ask the iterator. Is directory. Now if it is a directory, then we'll create a new task. But let me start with the else. So if this is a file, then it's very simple. We'll just push listing, push back. And what do we push back? The file name. The file name is available from the iterator through path. And we just want the, just the file name, not the whole directory path. So we say leaf. Leaf is just the file name. Okay. Now the, f the function leaf returns an R value reference to a string. So it will be automatically moved. We want to avoid copying as much as possible. Okay, now what do we do if this is a directory? Well, we have to launch an async task. So let's make room for a future that will be returned from std async. Now, I want to provide the launch policy because as you've seen, the default launch policy is actually not that good. So I just want to create separate threads for each task. It is an overkill, I admit, but there is no other option. Okay, so I'm passing it list directory, the pointer to my function, and I have to pass it the directory to be listed, right? So it's iterator, I get the path, and path actually returns a path, which is a path object. So I have to extract a file string out of it. Okay, close the parentheses. Good. And now I just push it on my vector. Push back. my future. And of course, again, I forgot to put move here. STD move. That's why it was highlighted. Okay, so we have this. Now let's close the loop. Okay. And now, with all these futures, we have to wait for them to complete. So again, we do a std for each. And go through this vector of futures. 
futures begin, comma, futures end, comma, and here we'll uh, pass it a lambda. This lambda takes a future, of course. Uh, std future of string vector, string vector by reference. And the body is very simple. Oh, I have to name it, right? Future, future, wait. Now, actually, we want to get, right? Because this is a future that doesn't uh, return void, it returns a string vector. So let's say string vector list equals future get. Now, since future get returns an R value reference, there will be no copying of this vector. This vector will actually be moved, which is good. We don't like copying, except when we have to. And in this case, we have to copy whatever listing was returned into our own listing. So list begin. So this list that was returned, list end, will be copied onto our vector. And we, we have to use the back inserter to push back whatever strings are in the listing. std back inserter of listing. This is the standard way of copying strings from one vector to another. Okay, so this is the end of the body. I have to close the parentheses too. Okay, and return listing. Let me show you what main does. Okay, main will list my directory called projects, which has lots of subdirectories and uh, files. So it starts an async, launch policy async. I want to make sure that there are actual threads and n at no point these tasks are executed one after another serially. I'm passing it list directory and my root and I put try catch around get because get may throw exceptions. I mean my directory listing throw exceptions. So I want to catch them. Now, as you can imagine, there is a whole tree of tasks. There, are parent, there is one parent task, there are subtasks, and there are subtasks of the subtasks, and so on. If any of them throws an exception, it will be passed to its parent. And if the parent doesn't catch the exception, it will be passed to its parent, and so on, until finally in, it ends in this particular future here. So when I call get on this future, I might get an exception, okay? And finally, the final listing, um, I'll just go through the final listing and print out all these strings. And here's the catch for the exceptions. And then finally, I'll wait for user input to stop the program, okay? Let's compile it, and of course it didn't compile, as usual. And it's also interesting to see why things don't compile. Here it says that the listing thing is not actually available. Listing is defined here, right? So why isn't it visible here? Well, because we are inside the Lambda. And the lambda has no access to external variables unless it is specifically captured. So I'm going to capture listing by reference. And now I can access it.
And this time it should compile. Done. So let me run it. It might take a long time. Amazingly enough, this program performs relatively well, considering that it creates probably hundreds of threads, which are the heavyweight operating system threads. Of course, it would be much better if we could use task-based parallelism and let the system decide how many threads to create and use them wisely. But since we don't have this in C++11, this is the best we can do. I'm recording this part a week after the original tutorial was released because there were some changes in the meanwhile. Anthony came out with an idea how to improve the performance of tasks that were generated with the default launch policy. The idea is to postpone the decision whether a task is run asynchronously or synchronously till the last moment. So let me show you how this works in practice. So as you can see, the threads are executed in batches. The tasks are executed in batches, so they run in parallel for most of the time. This is not full-blown task-based parallelism yet, because as you can see, new threads are created. There is 22 threads created. But the idea is that the operating system can somehow cache the resources used by threads and the creation of the next batch after the first one finished is much cheaper, much faster. So with this change, I could say that the um, default launch policy is not only usable, but also in most cases optimal.